Hi, this is Professor Paul, and you're watching a short video lecture I've produced about the Italian Renaissance poet Francesco Petrarch. So, Francesco Petrarca, uh, or Petrarch, the name he took, was a 14th century Italian poet, um, scholar, and diplomat. Uh, because he was very influential in terms of his um, philosophies on learning and his uh, many writings, he's often called the father of the humanists because of the way he set so many models for later thinkers and writers. And he was extremely prolific. He wrote on many, many subjects, travel, art, history, education, religion, and of course, he was a uh, very famous poet. Petrarch was extremely influential uh, in Italy and throughout Europe um, with Boccaccio, Giovanni Boccaccio, who wrote uh, a series of stories called The Decameron, and Dante, Dante Alighieri, who wrote The Divine Comedy. He's considered one of the models, one of the precursors of modern Italian literature who set um, the sort of standards for style and language. And in 1341, he became the Poet Laureate, indicating just how famous he was. He was considered uh, to be the greatest writer in Europe uh, by many uh, intellectuals, by most people, and certainly one of the most famous throughout Europe. And of course, he's most famous for his work, The Rheims Sparse, The Scattered Rhymes, um, which tell of his love for a woman named Laura who he supposedly saw on April 6, 1327, in Church of St. Claire de Avignon, and he was so struck by her beauty that she became the object of the sonnet, se sonnet sequence. And in it, of course, he tells of his great passion for her, as well as his despair, his struggles with that passion, because his love is unrequited. And he tells a narrative of Neoplatonic transcendence, eventually, of how he comes to conquer or transcend the earthly physical desire for Laura and what she represents. And um, this becomes a model for lyric poetry throughout Europe, it becomes the model for how to write about love, how to write about women, how to write about the poetic self. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some selections from his poetry and look at the journey that Petrarch undertakes. Um, and just so you know, the version that we'll be looking at, these is, this is a modern English translation from 2008. So here we have the first lines of his scattered rhymes. O oh, you who hear within these scattered verses the sound of sighs with which I fed my heart, in my first errant youthful days, when I in part was not the man I am today. So first question we might ask is, why does he begin by locating his poems in the past? Why does he begin by saying these are things that he once said? These are sighs that were from when he was a different man, not the man he is today. So we might think about what is he saying about the process of self-construction that we're going to witness in this poem, and as well how the poems reflect upon his identity and the formation of his identity as a poet. And what is significant about the images of scattered verses and the sound of sighs? How do those images characterize the poetry and the speaker itself? Why are they scattered? If they are scattered, then is he also scattered? And how does bringing them together then serve to reconstruct him as an individual, as a poet, as a man? He goes on to write, But now I see how I've become the talk, so long a time of people all around. It often makes me feel so full of shame. And from my vanities there comes shame's fruit, and my repentance, and the clear awareness that worldly joy is just a fleeting dream. The Neoplatonic influence should be very clear here in his attitude towards worldly joy. What's the irony of the speaker becoming the talk, as in the talk of the town? Why is it ironic that he is the one that, that he says they are talking about, and that in fact he feels shame over it? And we might think, what seems to be the speaker's purpose in relating these verses if he has truly come to this clear awareness why is he then retelling the story of his shameful love for Laura, for worldly, and his desire for worldly joys? And again, why is he telling us at the beginning that all the poems he's about to give us are poems about 
something that he no longer values. They're about what he used to love. They're about him overcoming his desire for Laura. It's a sort of strange paradox that he says, these poems I'm about to read are no longer how I feel in some sense. So what is he doing there? Sonnet 6, so far astray is my insane desire to chase this lady who has turned in flight and light and liberated of love's snares flies off ahead of my slow run for her. We should pay very close attention to the character's actions, what they literally as well as metaphorically do in the poems. So here we see something that we've seen before, chase and flight. Um, give, overlaying the hunting metaphor over the image of over the love discourse. Um, and it's a typical image that we've seen before, but it also does a great job of embodying the characters in their actions, in their physicality. Also note the contrast and the irony between the speaker and his love, that he has been snared by love, yet he's also the hunter trying to snare her. And she is, in fact, liberated. She is not snared by love. She is free of love while he is the one who's been captured and then, again, wants to project that onto her by capturing her in order to, we might say, free himself or fulfill what is enslaving him, the desires that are enslaving him. For love by its own nature makes him, that is, his desire, love by its own nature makes my desire restive. And when by force he takes the reins himself, I am left there in harness of his lordship, as he, against my will, rides me to death. So here we might compare Petrarch's description of emotion, what the inner experience of love is like, to how Ovid describes emotion. Uh, and in particular, the way Ovid often portrays emotion as uh, either external or as some sort of alien force that's separate from the individual experiencing the emotion. We can see that here, in a sense, look at the way Petrarch multiply displaces agency. He doesn't chase Laura, it's his desire that chases Laura. And he doesn't even have control over his desire. It's love that then motivates his desire. And this is all against his will. So we see him split between his desire and his will. So the question that we're asking here is how does Petrarch use the emotional language of Ovid to express the inner experience of his speaker? How does he adapt that Ovidian attitude, that Ovidian descriptive description of emotion to his own inner experience? And what metaphor does he employ to depict this experience of love? Notice the words reins, harness, rides. Who is what in that? What's going on in that metaphor? What is he literally saying is happening or metaphorically saying is happening when his desire takes over? And what's significant about the image of lordship? We might remember what it is that Acteon wants to say but cannot say. I am Acteon, recognize your master. And here, Petrarch has a question about who is master within him, who is master of him, of himself. From Sonnet 11, in sun or shade, I've never seen you, lady, remove that veil of yours since you discovered my so great desire that every other wish fades in my heart. What is the paradox of the speaker's situation here? Think in particularly of the idea of vision. What does he see and what doesn't he see? What's hidden from him? And what is the effect of what is hidden upon him? And what has the lady discovered? Think about the literal meaning. Again, break down the word discover. What is she doing, and we might compare her actions or what she's done to what he wishes she would do, removing the veil, right? So those that, again, the inversion, he, she is covered, he is discovered. So think about the dynamics of vision or the power that is shown through the act of seeing or not seeing, who has power and who is powerless, who is controlled. 
from Sonnet 13, again talking about vision. When love within her lovely face appears, now and again among the other ladies, as much as each is less lovely than she, the more the wish I love within me grows. Looking at the language here, we might think about what is the difference between love, capital L love, and her lovely face? Or what's the connection between the two? Does this sound like Neoplatonic thought in any way? And what does he experience as he sees her and compares her to other women? What is he seeing in her and how does it affect him? Continuing on in, in Sonnet 13, this is that wish that he said he was, uh, that was growing in him. And it's spoken by his eyes. His eyes are the ones that, that say these words. My soul, you must be very grateful that you were found worthy of such great honor. From her to you comes loving thought that leads, as long as you pursue, to highest good. Already I fly high upon my hope. So this, very early in the sonnet sequence, we see a very clear Neoplatonic influence, right? This idea of ascension. This beauty will lead you to something better. This is very early in the sequence. So this seems very hopeful, and the, the eyes say they are hopeful. But are there possible complications or challenges that are suggested even within this very hopeful poem? What are the difficulties that one might face, that the speaker might face, in pursuit of a goal or a hope or a wish? And why does he use those words in particular, hope, wish? Why are they uh, notable in terms of the way he describes what he's looking for, what he's experiencing here? And how does that set us up for what's going to happen in the rest of these scattered rhymes? Here, skipping down a few, we get to Sonnet 76, which is in many ways a counter to the previous sonnet, Sonnet 13. Love, by luring me with promises, led me again into my ancient prison, giving the keys to my own enemy, who still keeps me in exile from myself. And like a prisoner who truly suffers, I bear most of the marks that chain me down, and in my eyes and brow my heart is signed. So let's compare his attitude here and his attitude towards love here versus his attitude towards love in Sonnet 13. How has his situation changed? Who or what might his own enemy be? What is it that is his enemy that is in fact part of him or within him, we might say, yet also uh, an alien within him that keeps him in exile from himself? What does he reveal about this experience? Notice the words again and my ancient prison. What does that tell us about what's going on, what's happening in this sonnet? And note how openly he displays his inner truth, his heart on his own surface, his eyes and brow. They, they sign the truth of his heart. And we can contrast this with his own experience of the veiled Stella and what he cannot see, what he wishes to see of her. Sonnet 157. Her head fine gold, her face was like warm snow, her eyebrows ebony, her eyes two stars from where love never bent his bow in vain. Pearls and red roses where the gathered grief was transformed into ardent, lovely words, her sighs aflame, her tears as though of crystal. So this passage should, should sound very familiar. It's a typical example of Petrarch's influential poetic technique. This, and this description of the woman in parts that we've seen, for example, in the Natalie Vickers, or the Nancy Vickers art, article, uh, is called a blazon, uh, the description of, of her beautiful uh, outward features. Notice also the contradictions that he, that he employs, the warm snow, right? That's a paradox or an oxymoron. Uh, the contrasts, her grief, her grief becomes lovely words. And consider the importance of her voice. He endows it with essentially the power of poetic transformation. It is her lips and teeth that turn grief into beautiful words. Yet we don't actually hear her speaking, of course. It's he that is the poet. He's the one that's performing this action, yet he's attributing it to her at the same time. And 
here is uh, from Sonnet 190, the, the model for Wyatt's poem, Who So List to Hunt. A doe of purest white upon green grass, wearing two horns of gold, appeared to me between two streams beneath a laurel shade at sunrise in that season not yet ripe. So this is the original source, again, of Wyatt's Whoso List to Hunt. And we think about how does he transform the sonnet, the story of Acteon and Diana? How does Petrarch transform it? And then, of course, how does Wyatt reappropriate it for his own purposes? The sight of her was so sweetly austere that I left all my work to follow her, just like a miser who in search of treasure with pleasure makes his effort bitterless. So here, Petrarch's tone, um, how different is it from Wyatt's? How is it different? What is this speaker's attitude towards the, the action of pursuit versus Wyatt's attitude towards the act of pursuit? And what meanings might we derive from the imagery he uses, such as being a miser, um, all these sorts of images? What does he, uh, how does this characterize his des desire? Now skipping much further down near the end of the sequence from Sonnet 335, he writes, Among a thousand ladies I saw one, so great that amorous fear besieged my heart. Observing her through no false images, she looked just like a spirit of the heavens. No signs of earth or mortal cares in her, like one she was who cared only for heaven. My soul, which burned and froze for her so often, yearning to follow her, spread both its wings. So what are the ideas associated with vision and sight in this sequence? And think again about vision both as something that is empowering because you can see someone, but also something that can be dangerous because you can see what you're not supposed to see, like Acteon. So how does vision work? What is, it, what is the meaning of seeing and being seen in this sequence? How is Laura described? What ideas are associated with her? What images are associated with her? And why does the speaker use the word like when describing her? What's significant about that? And finally, how does the speaker's desire for her transform into something higher? Notice how he describes it desire for her and then a desire to follow her. Right? So what is he talking about here? How is his desire transforming? He goes on in this sonnet then to, to switch gears in the second half. He says, too high she was for earthly weight like mine, and soon she was out of my sight completely. I freeze and stiffen at the thought of it. O oh, lovely lofty windows of clear light where she who makes so many people grieve found entrance into such a splendid body. In the second six lines of the sonnet, how has his attitude shifted? What has happened to his desire? What's happened to him? How has he changed? Or what, what has he been unable to do from the first eight lines to the second six lines? What ideas are evoked when he talks about how he freezes and stiffens at the thought of his departed unseen love. What is he doing? What's happening to him emotionally, psychologically, physically? How does he then, and really what we're asking here is how does he weave together the physical and spiritual aspects of desire and love and also at the same time show their competition? And here we are, the last sonnet of the sequence, Sonnet 365. I go my way lamenting those past times I spent in loving something which was mortal instead of soaring high, since I had wings that might have taken me to higher levels. So what has happened to the speaker's desire for Laura? What has happened to Laura in the speaker's mind? And what's the tragic irony that the speaker has realized here? What has he realized was true all along, we might say. You who see all my shameful, wicked errors, king of all heaven, invisible, immortal, help this frail soul of mine, for she has strayed 
and all her emptiness fill up with grace. So we notice here how just as the speaker's object of desire shifted from Laura to God, he no longer desires Laura, now he wants God, so too does his audience shift. It had been earlier us, as well as in some sense Laura, we might say, um, but he talks at the beginning of, he's reading these poems to us, we, we who have seen him around town, but now he's directing his poetry to God. God is the ultimate audience. God is the one he wants to show himself to. God is the one who must read him and know him. What is the significance of a feminine soul? Why is it important that he talks about his soul as female? She has strayed and he wants her, he wants God to fill up his own emptiness with grace. So how does it shift? How does the relationship, the shift to a relationship with God, transform the speaker? What's happened to his position, his sense of self, his power? How does this, this change, reorientation towards, we might say, a neoplatonic truth, how does it transform him? And he ends with these lines. So that having once lived in storms at war, I may now die in peace in port. And if my stay was vain, at least let my departure count over the little life that still remains to me and at my death, deign that your hand be present. You know you are the only hope I have. So we see that what had been a prayer for romantic love, for recognition and, and response from Laura, has now become a prayer for divine grace. A similar sort of entreaty, but now, um, again, the, the dynamics have shifted radically. And we might think, how else have the speaker's desires transformed and what overall is transformed within him? How has he changed? What has he become? by the end of this poem, by the end of this sequence of poems. Let's close by looking at how Petrarch specifically adapts Ovid, the stories of Daphne and Apollo and Acteon and Diana. And these are just a couple of short excerpts from Song 23. These are these longer poems that are part of the scattered rhymes um, in between these sonnets. So here is Song 23 where he appropriates explicitly some of the Ovidian myths. Oh, what am I? What was I? The end lauds life, the night what day has brought. Because that savage one of whom I speak, aware that until now his arrow's blow had not pierced me beyond the clothes I wore, took as his patroness a mighty lady, against whom wit or force or begging pardon did serve me just as little then as now. Both of them changed me into what I am. From living man they turned me to green laurel that does not lose its leaves in the cold season. Let's break this down. Cupid is the savage one here, and he wishes to conquer the speaker. Why? Because the speaker has not truly fallen in love. He had only been pierced through his clothing by the arrow, so superficial, not even skin deep love. So Cupid wants to conquer the speaker to prove that his love is powerful. So in that sense, the speaker is taking the place of Apollo. He's the victim of Cupid's wrath. He's the one that Cupid wants his love to conquer, to show his greatness, the greatness of love. So Petrarch, or the speaker here, takes the place of Apollo, the unrequited lover. But Cupid also conspires with Laura, that's the mighty lady, to transform the speaker into the laurel tree. It is against her that the speaker cannot beg or plead. She has no mercy for him. She's unrelenting. So in that sense, the speaker also takes the spot of Daphne. He's the victim of desire. He's transformed into wood, into the tree. So he is both the one that pursues and the one that is frozen. He is both the, the one who must express himself through poetry because he cannot have his loved one. And he's also the crowning achievement of that. He is the, he is the, the sign of poetry itself. So it's a very complicated, condensed 
um, kind of transformation. And there's a lot of different strands to unweave in thinking about the psychosexual dynamics and the, the sexual politics of what Petrarch is doing here with this transformation. So it's just a very strange um, transformation of the story where he takes essentially the both important roles. Now let's look at his version of the Acteon myth a little bit later on in the same song. A mournful wandering spirit, I remember, through unfamiliar and deserted caves, I bewept for many years my unleashed boldness. And still again from that ill I found freedom, and I assumed once more my living form to suffer greater pain therein, I think. So let's look at the images here. He's wandering, he's directionless. So he has a sort of freedom, but he's without freedom. He can go wherever, but he has no direction, no real reason to do anything. And that phrase, unleashed boldness, right? It's like this, something that should be leashed within him, but it's unleashed, it's out of control. So again, he's free, but at the same time enslaved because he's driven by his own desires, his own whims. And he, but he experiences a recovery, a return to humanity. He finds freedom from that ill, but it's only the precursor to another fall. So as we see in, saw in the sonnets, that he has these moments of great joy, followed by depression, followed by joy. He's up and down. We see that here. And this is very typical of, a, of the model of a sinner's life, what Petrarch is drawing on here, the religious discourse of, of how one would describe their lives in, in, for example, an act of conversion as a sinner, one who kept falling, kept falling after attaining some measure of grace or goodness, then would fall again. So it's a very typical story that, that Petrarch is drawing on here. And my desire I pursued so far that one day, hunting as I often would, I came upon that cruel and lovely beast naked within a fountain when the sun strikes the hottest time of day. So we think here, what is the object of the speaker's pursuit? He says, my desire I pursued. He's pursuing his desire, not the thing he desires, but his desire itself. And it's his desire that then brings him to the one he will desire, the cruel and lovely beast that he cannot have. So you might think about the irony there. And look at the, the way she's described. She is both cruel and lovely. It's not exactly a contradiction, but there's a tension there. And we might also think, is she human or animal? He's hunting her, right? So he's hunting for a beast, but we also know from the Acteon story that Diana is a human form, at least. Um, but he, and he calls her a beast, but he also says she's naked. Do we describe animals as naked? It's only humans that can be naked because only humans wear clothes. So she's both animal and human, or perhaps neither animal nor human. I, since no other sight can please me more, stood gazing at her, but she felt ashamed, and to revenge herself or else to hide, she splashed some water up into my face. I'll tell the truth, though it may seem a lie. I felt myself ripped from my very image and quickly turned into a solitary wandering deer that moves from wood to wood. And still I feel the rage of my own hounds. So again, we could ask, how has Petrarch transformed Ovid's story? What has he done and why? Notice that this speaker doesn't die. He is still being torn apart, but he is still speaking. And even though he has been transformed into an animal, he still has speech. So how does Acteon's silence and death become the basis for Petrarch's speech and life? It is, again, Petrarch is sort of, or the speaker here is living in the middle of that transformation. He is in the, experiencing the dismemberment as he writes. And in a paradoxical way, by experiencing dismemberment, and then talking about it, he remembers himself. He reintegrates himself. And so again, note the many ironic contrasts and transformations that we've seen in this story and how they resonate with some of the others that we've seen in Petrarch.
So to review, the Petrarchan model of poetic expression and masculine poetic identity, this becomes the model that all other authors rely on and write for, or in some ways write against, when constructing themselves as love poets, as uh, individual male poetic voices. This is how they talk about suffering. This is how they, this is the language that they use. That's not to say they just imitate Petrarch. They're always challenging or transforming him. So for example, when you're reading Sidney, what does Sidney do with the Petrarchan model? How does he make it his own? Also, we notice that there's clearly the Neoplatonic influence, a Neoplatonic model here, but it's not a clear path to ascension. It's not a ladder in the sense that it's just something that one keeps going up and up and up. He goes up and down and up and down. It's a scattered narrative. It's a narrative of suffering because it is a human narrative. We can't just proceed upward. We must, in our lives, go up and down and up and down and suffer trials before we can, if we're lucky, succeed. And also note the way he adapts Ovid, the way he puts himself into Ovid and, and transforms those stories in order to make them serve his own poetic purposes. And so again, thinking about all these things, how do these ideas take them into your reading for Sydney this week? And think about how Sydney uses Petrarch and also departs from and Petrarch and constructs his own poetic identity. If you have questions, of course, you know you can contact me via email, Blackboard, or text. Otherwise, have a great week and good luck with your work.